everyone. Welcome to the CG webinar today. Today is our great pleasure and honor to have uh, Sheldon Morrison from uh, Current Institu Institution for Science, uh, Earth and Planets Laboratory, to speak with us uh, on the topic of the evolution of mineralogy. So Sharana got her PhD in 2017 at Arizona University, Tucson. And uh, since then, she moved to DC to uh, continue her career as a researcher and uh, currently until now. So with that, I'll give the rest of the time to Shauna. Thank you so much. I'll go ahead and share my screen. And let me see. I hope you guys are seeing it and get up my presentation. So um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and thank you all so much for coming. I know uh, we have people from different time zones all over the world. So really thank you so much um, for those of you who are up late at night uh, to watch this. I really, I really appreciate it. And um, so today what I'm going to talk to you um, about is a little bit of my uh, data-driven discovery in mineralogy and how we've been using data science approaches to explore outstanding questions in earth and planetary systems. And uh, most of the work you'll see here today is part of the 4D initiative in deep time data driven discovery and the evolution of planetary systems. So this initiative is bringing together researchers from a broad swath of Earth, space, life and data science to answer interdisciplinary questions that one of our fields alone cannot tackle. So my background is in mineralogy and crystallography, not data science. Uh, in fact, until a few years ago, I knew nothing about machine learning or multidimensional visualization. Uh, but through several collaborations, particularly with Bob Hazen at Carnegie uh, and Peter Fox's group at uh, RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, in Troy, New York, I began to learn more about these techniques and see how they could be useful to transform my field of mineralogy. Uh, and I have to say, it's been really fascinating for me to watch my field go from what for years has been a largely uh, descriptive science into a much more integrated and predictive one. For some time, we've primarily measured and described the characteristics of mineral samples we could collect from field sites or that we could synthesize in our labs. Historically, um, that's what we as mineralogists do. Um, but now, through our data-driven work, we're able to do things like make predictions of the number of missing mineral species we've yet to discover on Earth's crust, um, sorry, I'm having some trouble here with PowerPoint. Uh, use recommender systems to report, uh, to report probabilities of where to find new mineral deposits or analog environments. And we're also investigating whether or not Earth's unique mineral distribution is a planetary scale biosignature, which could have obvious applications to planetary exploration in both our solar system and beyond. So now we're also uh, developing an evolutionary system of mineralogy in which we use natural kind clustering to predict the specific formational environments of mineral specimens based on multivariate correlations in geochemistry. So we've seen uh, mineralogy come into this very predictive era. And, and what are the large scale driving scientific questions um, specifically behind my work and, and the work in the 4D initiative? Um, firstly, I'm working to characterize changes in the diversity and distribution of Earth's mineral species and its impact on geologic events and processes. I'm collaborating with biologists to better understand and deconvolve the complex feedback systems between Earth and life, which will allow us to better understand the coevolution of the geosphere and biosphere through deep time. And I'm also interested in investigating the systematic trends in mineralogy and geochemistry across planetary bodies in our solar system. And lastly, um, well, not lastly, I have a lot more interests I could list here, but the last one I'm going to say today is that I'm very interested in understanding uh, what are the most robust and unambiguous biosignatures and how can we detect them on other planetary bodies. So um, just to briefly let you know what data resources we're using, I'll go through a few quickly. Uh, note that all of these sources are publicly available, so feel free to explore them and use them for your own work. So to start, we have the International Mineralogical Associations, or IMAs, list of approved mineral species, which is hosted and run by the Rough Project at the University of Arizona. Bob Downs was my, my PhD advisor, and um, so I've worked closely with this data resource. There are about um, 5,600 uh, distinct mineral species recognized by IMA. So uh, on this website, you can search for a particular mineral, or you can use the chemistry filter. You can also search on the many tags you see right here. Um, but what I'd like to point out is the Mineral Evolution Database. You can click this button and be directed there uh, to the MED, or you can go to the URL at the top. 
Um, this database was pioneered by Bob Hazen and represents countless hours of literature review. Josh Golden from the University of Arizona has led the data collection. Uh, he's done much of it himself and has also trained a lot of undergraduate student workers to work on this data resource as well. Uh, the database contains location information for minerals on Earth's surface, many of which have an age associated with them. Currently, we have approximately 1 million mineral locality pairs, and more than 160,000 of those mineral locality pairs are dated. So this is a pretty big resource. Another great database is mindat.org. This website provides a list of minerals that have been observed at specific localities on Earth's surface. And to date, they have nearly 300 thousand geologic localities and about a million mineral locality pairs. So also a huge resource. Uh, we were just talking about EarthChem uh, before I got started. And of course, this is a major resource uh, for uh, geochemical information from rocks around the world. We use this all the time. And uh, also associated with EarthChem is MoonDB, which contains all of the lunar rock data from uh, NASA JSC and uh, any of the work done elsewhere uh, on those samples. And we're also in the process of building astromaterials uh, DB, which will inhale MoonDB and will also contain other uh, planetary materials curated at NASA JSC, particularly in meteorites. Both of those websites are up. Not all the data is there, but you're still welcome to explore. They're under construction. And uh, lastly, I'd like to mention a couple of our databases that are uh, not quite up yet, but are we are in the process of building. The first is the Mineral Properties Database, or MPD. This database contains myriad characteristics of mineral species, including the number of localities at which they occur, their paragenetic modes, or the way in which they form, their structural complexity, color, you're discovered, and a lot more. Uh, the second is the Evolutionary System of Mineralogy, uh, or ESMD. Uh, which is a huge undertaking in which we're collecting geochemical analyses and, if possible, other chemical and physical attributes of individual mineral samples. So you'll see in the video here that um, while not all specimens contain the information in every field, we're collecting over 150 different attributes. Uh, these data are being used in natural kind clustering studies to examine the paragenesis of minerals throughout the evolutionary history of our solar system. I'll go more into that project uh, towards the end. So now let's uh, let's take a step back. I keep using the term um, mineral, and some of you may be very familiar with it, but in case we have some people from different backgrounds, I'd like to define it. A mineral is a naturally occurring solid that has both a well-defined chemical composition, like the olivine group and member, forsterite you see here, which is Mg2SiO4, and also a well-defined crystal structure with the structure of forsterite shown here on the right. So why do we study minerals? Uh, firstly, they're the oldest physical samples of the geologic past. Secondly, within their complex chemical and physical characteristics, they contain information about their formational conditions and any subsequent weathering and alteration they might have undergone. They characterize bioavailability of elements through deep time, and they allow us to relate the timing of element availability to the emergence and evolution of biological function. So now let's get into um, some of the projects related, um, some are, or some of the projects and discoveries related to these ideas. I'm gonna go through several of them um, pretty quickly, but of course, if you have questions, um, please ask them at the end or, or feel free to reach out uh, to me via email. So um, we have a mixed group, I assume. So many of you may not be familiar with uh, mineral evolution and mineral ecology. So I'm gonna give you a very quick background on these two fields. Um, and the driving motivation behind mineral evolution is to understand how Earth's and other planets' mineralogy has changed through deep time and what geologic, biologic, and planetary processes caused those changes. This work, of course, has been pioneered by Carnegie's Bob Hazen with a lot of involvement from Bob Downs at the University of Arizona. I got involved in this work uh, when I was uh, still a graduate student. And what this work relies on is the fact that a planet's mineral forming environments and therefore ultimately its mineralogy changes at every stage of planetary evolution, which offers a physical, chemical and biological framework to understand planetary conditions through deep time. So let me be a bit clearer about what I mean. Um, initially, our solar system was too hot to form minerals, but it eventually cooled enough to uh, condense tiny micro and nanoscale grains of minerals, including diamond, graphite, um, silicon carbide. And in this earliest stage of mineral evolution, there were about a dozen to a couple dozen uh, mineral species. Next, as the solar nebula cooled, uh, material began to condense further and form planetesimals that we now have samples of in the form of meteorites. 
In the next stage, Earth formed and eventually cooled enough to start making a primitive crust made of basalt, which brought us up to around 500 mineral species. Igneous rock evolution and differentiation of the crust continued and formed, to for, uh, and formed the first granite crust and pegmatites, um, which doubled the mineral diversity to around 1,000. Then the tally was increased to 1,500 minerals by the onset of plate tectonics and the reworking of the crust. And uh, this represents Earth history up until about 2.5 billion years ago. But if you recall, I said there are around 5,600 mineral species on Earth today. Most of the dramatic increase in mineral diversity occurred after this time period um, and after the Great Oxidation Event, or GOE, which was when oxygen in our atmosphere increased uh, largely due to the rise of oxygenic photosynthesis of cyanobacteria around 2.5 billion years ago, as I said, and it completely changed the near surface chemistry of our planet. Um, for example, prior to the great oxidation event, the oxygen fugacity of our atmosphere was too low uh, to form more than half of the copper mineral species known today. This is a similarly, similarly true for all other redox sensitive elements. And this, you can see that on this, on this diagram here, um, which was actually, I believe, created by Jiwa Hao, um, who I think may be on the line today. Hi, Jiwa, if you're on. Um, and he's made several of these for us. And yeah, we can see this, this same uh, trend is true for lots of redox sensitive elements. So just to summarize some of the key findings of mineral evolution studies, uh, we found that there are pulses of mineralization associated with supercontinent assembly. That Earth's atmospheric oxidation is recorded in the mineralogical record. And that there's a strong increase in mineralization with the rise of the terrestrial biosphere related to things such as skeletal bio mineralization and uh, root systems and clays. So now let's briefly turn to mineral ecology. Uh, in this work, we're asking what drives the diversity and distribution of minerals on a planet and what information can be predicted from the statistics of this diversity and distribution. With mineral ecology, we found that Earth's mineralogy follows an LNRE or large number of rare events trend. This is somewhat similar to Zipf's law uh, in which most mineral species are rare and there are only a few that are common species like quartz, calcite, the feldspars, and so on. Uh, we can model this trend and make accumulation curves similar to those used in ecology to predict the number of as yet undiscovered mineral species on Earth. So here you can see the frequency distribution of carbon minerals. This distribution and the resulting accumulation curves allows us to predict the number of missing uh, mineral species, which was 145 in the case of carbon. The study has led to the discovery of 31 new carbon mineral species uh, through the Carbon Mineral Challenge led by Dan Hummer at Southern Illinois University. So please check out mineralchallenge.net uh, for more information on that study and the minerals that were discovered. We're continually working to improve uh, Earth's uh, mineral abundance. And one of the ways we've done this is to start by using uh, Bayesian techniques. The original estimate of the number of mineral species on Earth was approximately 6,000, which we knew was a low estimate. Uh, now with the techniques that are designed for fitting smaller data sets, we've been able to increase the accuracy of our models and our updated prediction is around 9,000 mineral species on Earth. Keep in mind, however, that this is still an underestimate. Uh, we currently don't have a way to model what will happen when new technology makes mineral discovery more rapid or it makes it possible to characterize minerals that are currently too small or too difficult to characterize with today's technology. We don't know what the new tech might be, um, but we're working to model how different technological advances, uh, such as the microprobe, affected mineral discovery in the past, and we might be able to use these models to better estimate what might happen uh, when future technology enters the scene. So up until this point, I've been describing what has been uh, qualitative in the case of mineral evolution or statistical in the case of mineral ecology, but we knew that we could go farther and harness the complex multi-dimensional information that exists within mineralogical and planetary systems. Uh, this is when we turned to our data science colleagues for help uh, with machine learning and advanced visualization. We needed help to get out of XY plot land, and it was critical that we work alongside data science experts to do so in a meaningful and robust way. I'd like to emphasize that the cooperation between Earth and data scientists is, is critical. Uh, if you just give your data to a data scientist, they're likely not going to know enough about the driving questions or the nuances of these complex natural systems to get meaningful results without some input from you. Uh, likewise, I tried to run, if I tried to run a high level machine learning algorithm, chances are I'm not going to understand the math or their operations enough to produce meaningful and accurate results. That is if I can even get the code 
to run at all, which is, you know, a, a big question in itself. But um, so what I'm saying is that I found that working very closely together with uh, is the best way to get meaningful and useful results out of domain and data science cross disciplinary work. So my group at Carnegie is made up of a mixture of people from earth and data science and uh, we, we find that that works really well. So one such uh, technique is network analysis. Uh, we're using uh, te this technique in different systems, but today I'll mostly focus on that of minerals because I'm a mineralogist, but I'll give you an example uh, with fossils as well. Um, as I said before, the diversity, distribution, and composition of minerals provides a framework for answering questions and making predictions regarding the timing, extent, underlying cause, and relationships between complex geologic, biologic, and planetary events through deep time. So we needed a tool that would allow us to visualize, analyze, and explore the complex multidimensionality of this multivariate mineral system. And network analysis is ideal for that. It's designed for that. So why networks? Networks are ubiquitous throughout the natural and man-made world. Um, even if you think you're not familiar with them, you are. Um, the neurons in your brain form a network. Rivers and, and the bridges and road systems that cross them form a network. Uh, networks can be of people like say the social media networks that we're probably all a little too connected on uh, like Twitter, uh, like the Twitter network you're seeing here. Uh, they can be collaboration networks like that of the 4D initiative, or it could be the spread of contagious disease, which has become extremely relevant to all of our lives over the past year. Networks can be artificially designed like the internet uh, network at your office or the power grid in your city or town. Uh, networks can be virtual like web pages on the internet or they can be of ideas or concepts like knowledge networks and knowledge graphs. Uh, networks are a fantastic way to model complex interconnected systems and they are used in many realms of science, engineering, and a lot more. So we wanted to know if mineralogy could benefit from the robust foundation that has been built for network theory. So I've told you what networks are in an abstract sense, but I'm going to uh, now show you a lot of networks. So I'll try to give you a very quick, a quick explanation of, of what they are and what they mean in the sense that I'm using them. So networks are made up of nodes and links. Each node represents an entity in our data object. In our case, uh, nodes will represent a mineral or a fossil or a mineral locality, a location that a mineral occurs at on Earth. The links represent relationships between those nodes. So in the case of a mineral network, the link could represent co-occurrence of two mineral species. And these links and nodes come together to form an interconnected network, which could represent all of the minerals of a single element, of a specific deposit, of a rock type, or even an entire planet. Note that you can color, size, shape, and adjust the transparency of the nodes and links in order to represent whatever attribute of the data you're interested in. For example, it could be chemical composition or age of occurrence. And I'll show you some of these examples, but the point I like to make here is that you can layer information on top of information in a way that allows you to visualize dimensions and many variables at once in a way that is digestible to the human brain, much more so than if you were to try to examine these data in a spreadsheet or with more traditional plotting techniques. So there are two types of metrics um, that you can query uh, mineral or networks in general with. Um, I'm, uh, first is, is local. I'm just going to mention a couple of these. So these are metrics that apply to a single node uh, in a network. And they help answer questions like how important is one node and does one node communicate between two distinct groups, things like that. And then there are global metrics. And these are things that give us information about the entire network. And with that, we can answer questions like, is the network highly interconnected? Does the network form distinct clusters or groups? So um, just to show you a few, there are many, um, but I'm just gonna show you a couple of the most basic ones to give you a, a feel for what they're like. Um, so for local, we have things like degree, which is the number of links connected to a given node. We have distance, which is the geodesic or shortest path between any two nodes. And betweenness, which is a measure of the geodesic pass or the shortest paths that path through, that pass through, that's a tongue twister, <laughs> the shortest paths that pass through a given node. Uh, and then of course we have a few global ones here. We'll just mention some of the most basic metrics. And uh, the first is density. So that's the number of uh, links divided by the number of uh, possible links. So that is how densely connected is this network? Is it kind of loosely dispersed or is it very tightly connected? 
Um, then we have diameter, which is the largest uh, geodesic distance in a network. It's the shortest path between two most separated nodes. So here you're kind of thinking about the degree of separation, if you will. And then we have mean different dis mean distance, uh, which is the average degree of separation in a network. So we also have uh, several centralization metrics. Centralization is always looking at um, how central a network's most central node is relative to how central all of the other nodes are. There are several of these metrics, but for instance, if you're interested to know if there are many highly interconnected nodes, you're gonna look at degree centralization. If you wanna know if there are a few key broker nodes, um, you're gonna wanna look at between the centralization. And again, there are several of several more uh, metrics that you could explore. So now let's actually look at one of our networks. Um, the first network I'd like to show you is that of copper minerals. In this network, each node represents a copper mineral species. They're colored according to uh, chemistry, specifically the presence or absence of sulfur and oxygen. And the nodes are sized according to their frequency of occurrence on Earth's surface. So if they occur often, they're larger. Uh, if they occur less often, they're smaller. Lastly, the links are scaled inversely proportional to the frequency of co-occurrence. So if two minerals occur frequently, they will be closer together in the network. Now, if we take a look at the network as a whole, you'll probably notice that we have some distinct chemical partitioning straight away. Sulfides tend to form with sulfides, oxides tend to form with the oxides, and the sulfates tend to form with the sulfates. It's important to understand that the only information included in the layout is mineral occurrence and co-occurrence. The fact that chemistry is so evident here is not because we coded it into the network layout, it's because it is naturally embedded in the data within the relationships between these mineral species. In fact, we can go even as far as to look at redox axes in this network. So first we can see there's a distinct oxygen fugacity line as well as a sulfur fugacity trend. So we know we can get higher order information out of these relationships just by glancing in the network. Imagine what we can do when we begin to start doing statistical analyses uh, on these data objects. So uh, as I mentioned before, one of the most useful features of the network uh, is that you can overlay any attributes of the nodes you're exploring. In our case, we're exploring minerals, so we would overlay chemistry, as I showed you in the last example, uh, but we could also overlay age, number of localities, perigenetic mode, or any other parameter you'd like. You can size, shape, adjust the transparency, and so on um, to represent whatever, whatever relationship you want. So here we've overlain a crystal structure complexity onto the copper mineral network. So this is the same network you were looking at before, but now the nodes are colored by crystal structure complexity. We're working with Dr. Sergei Kravovichev, who has developed a method for quantifying the complexity of these uh, mineral structures in terms of bits of information. Sergei hypothesizes that mineral structural complexity has increased through deep time, and we're trying to help him test that hypothesis. And we can certainly see some embedded uh, trends of structural complexity here in this network. We see that from the top left uh, to the bottom right, we go from mostly very simple and simple uh, structures into uh, intermediate complexity. And it's interesting, however, that the complex and, and very complex minerals, although they're relatively few, are dispersed throughout the network. So we're still working with Sergei to try to understand why that might be. So there's a lot more work to be done here. Uh, here you can see the co-occurrence network of chromium mineral species uh, colored by their formational environment. Uh, so straight away you can see that there's a natural segregation based on these formational environments with weathering minerals tending to form together, sedimentary minerals, etc. And this network is highly centralized with chromite being the main broker node that co-occurs with many of the other phases in the network. This is due to the fact that chromite is often uh, the primary chromium phase and other phases result as weathering or alteration products. These networks are highly interactive. Uh, if you go to our deep time data infrastructure website, which I'll give you on my last slide, you can hover over a node to find out what it is and you can pull them out and move them around to get a better vantage point of what's connected to what. Um, which brings up an important point when you're looking at networks. This is a representation of, oh, in this case, probably about 100 dimensional space projected down into two dimensions. And what the network code does is try to solve for the best representation of the relationships that exist in 100 dimensional space. It's essentially trying to find the lowest energy configuration, if you will. So while many uh, trends and relationships are immediately clear, you can learn a lot by moving the nodes around and seeing what is connected to what. 
Um, another important point to make uh, in regards to the fact that this that the networks themselves are a projection, the data objects themselves are not a projection. So any of these metrics or uh, statistical tests or analyses that you're running on the data object itself uh, is preserved in that 100 dimensional space. So we're not seeing you know, any reduction or loss of information when we're, when we're actually performing analyses on the data object. So here's a similar network, uh, but with carbon minerals rather than uh, chromium or copper. And this diagram shows how the carbon mineral network has evolved through deep time. So each one of these networks represents carbon minerals that occurred up until a specific time period. You can see that time period uh, at the bottom. And uh, the nodes are colored according to their chemical composition, specifically whether they're organics, uh, carbides, anhydrous or hydrous, and whether or not they contain transition elements, lanthanides or actinides. You'll see that the oldest networks are simple and have very few species. Uh, more and more hydrous phases pop up as we move into recent time. And around 250 MA, we start to see the network topology separate into two distinct lobes. The left side has more hydrous phases and transition elements, whereas the right side has more anhydrous phases and hydrous phases without transition elements. We're still exploring what this means in terms of carbon uh, mineral co-evolution or, or, or co-occurrence through deep time, but uh, it's a pretty, pretty interesting find. We're clearly seeing some trends here, so now it's a matter of, of digging down into that. So now I'd like to show you a slightly different type of, of carbon network. Uh, this is called a bipartite network or a bipartite graph. Here we have two different types of nodes. The colored nodes correspond to carbon minerals, like, the, like what you saw in the last, uh, the last slide. And the black nodes correspond to the localities at which carbon minerals are found on Earth's surface. The mineral nodes are sized and colored according to their frequency occurrence, but um, let's change that and color them by their age of first occurrence. You can see these networks are interactive. You can explore them on our website, which again, I'll give you the link for at the end. Uh, the black locality nodes are sized according to their mineral diversity or the number of distinct mineral species that are found there. There are a number of interesting pieces of information we can get out of the networks, but for today, I'll just illustrate two of them. And uh, the first is that uh, the network topology may be a biosignature on a planetary scale. And the second is that there are timelines embedded in network topologies of evolving systems. As I mentioned earlier, we're seeing these higher dimensional uh, trends, these higher dimensional uh, products kind of popping out of these networks. And this is one of them, a particularly exciting one. So let's start with the biosignatures. This network illustrates well the diversity and distribution of minerals on Earth's surface. The mineral frequency uh, distribution follows that LNRE trend I mentioned earlier, which in, in uh, most minerals are rare. And uh, you can see by the number of small nodes kind of skirting around the network, there are only a few. Uh, there are a lot of these rare ones, and then there are only a few which are very common, which you can see are nested kind of in the center of the network. And this is a visual representation of the LNRE distribution of mineral species. So this coupled with the high mineral diversity appears to be unique within our solar system and it's likely the result of biological input. Um, we've, been, we've begun to try to evaluate the mineral diversity and distribution of other planetary bodies, specifically Mars with meteorite and surface mission data, the moon with lunar samples and Vesta with HED meteorites. At this point, it's very hard to make a direct comparison, except perhaps with the moon, because we have a lot of data and a lot of samples returned. But, um, you know, meteorites are generally igneous in origin, and surface missions have only sampled small areas, and they have very limited technology generally. So um, it does, but it does prime preliminarily look like the mineral diversity of these bodies is significantly lower. And the phases that are present do not follow an LNRE distribution. So this is an idea that we're exploring, um, but the diversity and distribution of minerals we observe on Earth very well may be a planetary scale biosignature and something that we can use for future uh, planetary exploration. So now back to the second feature of bipartite mineral networks I wanted to show you. This is the embedded timeline. Here we see the same carbon network in which the mineral nodes are colored by age, with red being the oldest, moving into blue uh, being the youngest. And what we see here is that at the core of this, within this ring of localities, we have the oldest phases in red, moving up into orange and then into yellow and then out into blue as we move out around the ring. Again, no age information was put into this layout. The timeline just naturally falls out of the data, which is pretty exciting. This is also true of fossil networks, which I think seems intuitive, uh, more intuitive than you would with mineral networks, given that we're dealing with Darwinian evolution here. Um, but there's one additional interesting piece of information we can get out of these fossil networks, and that's mass extinctions. 
So here we see the coexistence of animal species through time, starting with the Cambrian, going into the Paleozoic, and then into modern fauna. So there's an obvious timeline, which we expected. But we didn't exactly expect to see these pinch points in the network. It turns out that each of these pinch points corresponds to a known mass extinction event in the fossil record. It's very important when you're trying out a new technique that you learn to identify things that you already know to be true, that this, that this technique, that this tool can, can show you things that you already know um, exist, trends you already know to be true, um, things like these mass extinctions. So now we know that the pinch points may, send, may signal a punctuated event in the evolutionary record. So when we turn to the trilobite network and found a pinch point here that didn't correspond to any known mass extinction event, my colleague uh, Drew Macenti started digging into this problem and found that this punctuation event corresponded to a massive faunal turnover towards the end of the trilobite record. A few older papers uh, had speculated that something might have happened here, but with just one glance at the network, we were able to clearly see this event and my colleague was able to characterize it. So networks can be a, a very, very powerful tool. Um, so the last network analysis related project I'd like to mention is the most interdisciplinary of them all. Um, it's studying the coevolution of proteins and the geologic environment. Uh, this work is part of the larger uh, NASA Astrobiology Enigma node uh, project to better understand the origin and evolution of proteins and catalysis. In this project, we're using metagenomic, geochemical, mineralogical, tectonic, and environmental data. Again, certainly the most interdisciplinary data set I've worked with. Um, I won't go into great detail here, but we're aiming to answer questions about whether or not microbial populations and their expressed protein functions are constrained by their geochemical environment. And likewise, what effect do they have on their surrounding environments? So um, we want to know whether or not metal availability uh, through geologic time affected protein evolution and vice versa. Um, the answer to this question uh, is very difficult to get at. This is very complicated. But if we find that that answer, however convoluted is yes, then we may be able to use the bioavailability of these metals and the mineralogical record to constrain the timing of protein evolution, which is really hard to do. Um, this project is, of course, looking at modern day microbes and environments because we don't have ancient microbial DNA, which is exactly why it's hard to, to date them, right? Um, but we're working with genomics and microbial ecology experts to uh, try to take this back in time. So this is by far one of the hardest projects that I think we're tackling just by its multidisciplinary nature. But this is a great, great case study in bringing together um, when you can do answer really cool questions when you bring together people from very different fields. So lastly, we're also exploring new and better ways uh, to explore our network data. And this includes virtual reality, which came out of a collaboration with Deep Time, uh, with the, uh, sorry, Deep Carbon Observatory and UC Davis. This immersive experience allows us to see trends in our data that we weren't readily visible on a two-dimensional screen. I was actually quite surprised with um, how much of a different view of my data that it gave me. I was able to see trends that I never saw on the 2D screen. So I'm actually pretty excited about this. You can see this was before the time of masks. This was a probably, this was well, uh, well maybe about a year and a half ago. So, um, you know, very different time. Um, so uh, now we've talked a lot about networks and uh, so now we can kind of bridge into something that is somewhat built on kind of a data object that is similar to a network's data object. So all of these algorithms are, are connected in a way. Um, so the next, the next one I'd like to mention is affinity analysis or association analysis. Uh, association analysis is a recommender system that characterizes uh, multidimensional co-occurrence relationships and creates probabilistic models for future or currently unknown co-occurrences. Most of you have encountered these types of algorithms with companies like Amazon or Netflix who use the purchase history of all of their users to predict what you might want to buy or watch based on just a few selections. Um, like them, we can leverage our large mineral occurrence data resources to characterize these multi-mineral, multi-dimensional correlations and generate probabilities of where else we expect to find a given mineral or a mineral assemblage or a geologic environment um, on Earth or, or another planetary body. So we do this by generating a list of association rules. These rules are made up of a left-hand side or LHS, uh, which is a mineral assemblage and a right-hand side or RHS, which is a single mineral or mineral assemblage we'd like to characterize in terms of the left-hand side. So for example, if you have calcite, pyrite, quartz, and sphalerite at a particular locality, you have a certain likelihood that that locality will also contain calcopyrite. 
There are various metrics for quantifying that probability, including support, which is an indication of how frequently a rule occurs across all query localities, uh, confidence, which is a measure of how often a rule is found to be true in a given data set, and lift, which is a measure of a positive or negative correlation or how independent the left hand and right hand uh, side of a rule are from one another. This can be illustrated with a graphical representation where the size of the circle indicates how often the rule occurs in our data set. Uh, the more occurrences, the more statistic statistically significant. And we uh, have also colored by lift with darker red indicating that the left hand side and right hand side are more dependent of, of one another or they occur together uh, more frequently than they occur apart. We can also examine these rules as a directed co-occurrence network, of course, uh, in which we can clearly see trends in which uh, minerals tend to occur most frequently and which minerals are most often associated with one another. Note that for simplicity, we've limited this diagram to 50 running rules, so this does not show all mineral co-occurrences, but this is something we're working on and uh, we'll make it available with the publication of the manuscript, which will hopefully happen soon. Uh, because this problem is very computationally intensive and requires high performance computing, as we were talking about at the beginning for anyone who was on, we are getting into this territory of having enough data and asking complicated enough questions that we do actually have to go to um, high performance computing. So uh, we're working to optimize the code, but in the meantime, we're working on a case study to apply this technique to a few selected subsets of data, specifically based on geography, geochemistry, and time. The first is a geographic subset of the United States. It was chosen um, because the data for the US have high mineralogical diversity, a good deal of documentation, extensive geographic coverage, and a broad range of geologic environments. The second uh, subset is uh, geochemical and working with our uh, uranium mineralogy colleagues uh, at the University of Notre Dame, we selected uranium, uranium due to its role in the redox history of various uh, deposit types, as well as its interest related to nuclear energy and uh, particularly nuclear forensics. So note that while we used uranium as the starting point for selecting the mineral localities, all minerals, whether they have uranium or they don't, that are found at any of these uranium mineral localities are included in the algorithm that's critical to characterizing the co-occurrence relationships. So um, lastly, we uh, selected all uh, mineral, occurrence dated, mineral occurrences dated to the Paleozoic or earlier in order to examine mineral associations through deep time and compare mineral relationships at different stages of planetary evolution. So we're still actively exploring uh, these systems, but we'll give you a few preliminary examples of the types of queries we can run. For instance, we may have a particular locality of interest and we'd like to know what minerals we expect to find there and that we haven't already discovered. If we select Wave Hill in the Northern Territory, we see that we have a high probability, high probability of finding analcyme, epidote, hematite, and so on. This could be used uh, on a locality of any size from a tiny hot spring to an entire planet. Next, uh, we could have a particular mineral we're interested in, and we would like to know where we're likely to discover the next occurrence. Uh, for instance, based on association rules of rhodochrosite, rhodonite, and tephroite, I can predict that there is a high likelihood that tephroite could be found at a couple of locations in Kazakhstan, as well as in the US and Sweden. Remember, these rules can also make predictions on mineral assemblages. So we can predict deposits or environments that are characterized for a uh, certain mineral assemblage. For instance, I would like to know the location that may uh, for I would like to find a location that may be a good Mars analog. Um, I can predict which locations are most likely, even when all of the minerals um, are not currently known at that site. So I don't have to have you know if I'm if there are five minerals on Mars that I'm interested in, I can find a site on Earth that has only three of those, but I can make a prediction about how likely they are to contain the other two. So I can have a feel for how likely it is to actually be an analog site. So um, that's a pretty, pretty powerful tool. So based on all known uh, mineral occurrences, we can ask questions like, uh, where can I find a new locality of a certain mineral? What other minerals as yet unreported can I find at a locality of interest? And where can I find a deposit uh, or environment of interest? This algorithm allows us to characterize mineral occurrence across our planet and other planetary bodies. And it's just one example of the predictive power and possibility that lies within multidimensional multivariate mineralogical systems. 
And in fact, we've actually been able to ground truth this method. So with a very simple pairwise implementation uh, of this method on MINDAT, Jollyon was able to predict that there was an unreported occurrence of wolfenite in New Mexico. And with this information, uh, MINDAT associate Aaron Delventhal was able to go out in search of this wolfenite and was able to confirm that it does indeed occur at the predicted locality. So it was pretty exciting to get some grounds truth straight away on even just a simplified version of this method. Another project I'd like to just very briefly mention is related to my work on the Curiosity Rover X-ray diffraction instrument Kimin. With Kimin, we're able to quantitatively estimate which minerals uh, are present in Gale Crater on Mars, and we're also able to determine their abundance in major and basic major element uh, composition. While basic major element composition tells us a lot about the geologic history of a deposit, um, complex major and minor mineral chemistry tells us a lot more. So I turn to machine learning, specifically label distribution learning. This technique was originally developed for facial recognition in photographs, but we were able to modify it for our purposes. And this is very exciting work because for the first time we can predict major and minor chemical components in minerals with X-ray diffraction data alone. Um, for those of you who don't, don't do mineral analysis, that may not mean a lot to you, but um, this is near the accuracy of an electron microprobe, which is an instrument that fills an entire room and in general is put on the ground floor of a room because it needs to be uh, kept at a certain temperature and kept incredibly still and stable. So to be able to replicate results on the order of an instrument that is almost impossible to ever send into space is incredibly exciting. So this technique uh, is immediately obviously applicable to the minerals observed in Gale Crater, and it will give us a better picture of the geologic history of the Martian surface. Um, and while it will not replace uh, high precision uh, chemical analyses on Earth, it can also allow for a quick assessment of major and minor uh, chemistry in a laboratory setting. Um, and, and most importantly, uh, looking ahead, this method could be very useful for future planetary missions in which similar X-ray diffraction technology is employed. Being able to send an X-ray diffractometer to another planet um, gives us a level of understanding of its geologic history that is beyond what any other type of instrument can do. And with the addition of machine learning, we can push those X-ray diffraction capabilities even farther. And we can do something that, like I said before, generally requires an instrument that fills an entire room. So from a future mission, from a space exploration, from understanding the, the geologic history, uh, the planetary history of other uh, bodies within our solar system and beyond, um, X-ray diffraction is a very exciting technique and machine learning is really pushing those boundaries. So um, the last and arguably most important and culminating project I'd like to mention is the development of the evolutionary system of mineralogy and the natural kind clustering within that system. This work harnesses the fact that minerals are incredibly information rich. They offer the opportunity to integrate their characteristics and parameters such as minor and trace elements, isotopic ratios, structural defects, inclusions, textures, morphologies, all of this to gain a multidimensional holistic mineralogical perspective of the dynamic chemical, geological, biological, and planetary materials and processes through deep time. I said a lot there, but in building this system, we are characterizing minerals by their formational environments and contexts, which allows us to ask questions like, how do we determine the formational environment of a mineral sample? Let's take, for example, pyrite. Pyrite forms in many environments and ways, some of which have biological input, some don't. Um, most don't. Um, but if I tell you that I found a pyrite on Mars, what does that tell you about the Martian environment? Not a whole lot. It could be any one of these, you know, several that, that it forms in. So um, it tells you that it could have had a range of conditions and materials, but that's not very helpful for determining the geologic conditions or if there was any biological input into those environments. However, that information is locked within each mineral specimen. In order to extract this information, we turn to our colleagues, Ross Large and uh, Dan Gregory, and together they have a series of highly detailed and robust databases on the geochemistry and in some cases, texture and morphology of thousands of pyrite grains. I think it's around 6,000 samples in all, so it's a really big data set. And we can use machine learning, specifically cluster analysis and, uh, and later classification uh, schemes to examine the multivariate correlations across the various major, minor, and trace elements within these samples. 
Here you can see the preliminary cluster analysis uh, results from our former Carnegie postdoc, Shuang Zhang, who I am very proud to report and excited to report um, that he's recently begun a faculty position at Texas A&M. Uh, much deserved. They're very lucky to have him. Our loss, of course. But um, so basically, he's, uh, he's still working on this project, and he's been able to determine that there are some clear delineations associated with uh, pyrite formational environments. One of these very clear delineations is associated with temperature. Samples cluster into two distinct groups, high and low uh, temperature formation. These groups can be further clustered by their specific formational environments within each high temperature and low temperature regime. Therefore, we are now able to develop an integrated clustering classification scheme in which we can predict the formational environment of any pyrite specimen of unknown origin, and we can apply a similar workflow to other mineral systems. Currently, we've developed a database of over 100,000 garnet analyses, and that data paper will be submitted to ESSD in the very near future, as well as a database of 1,600 pre-solar silicon carbide grains, 178 feldspar, uh, 178,000 feldspar samples, and 3,500 chloride analyses. So we're excited to be able to examine the natural kind clustering of these systems as well. And I'd like to just briefly mention what we've been doing with these pre-solar silicon carbide grains. Uh, firstly, these tiny remnant grains of star formation have been classified by their nitrogen and carbon isotopic ratios and were thought to fall into six groups related to different stellar environments. However, Asma Bujibar, a postdoc uh, with us at Carnegie, has led a project in collaboration with a pre-solar grain expert, uh, Larry Nittler, who's also based at Carnegie, uh, to explore these data and see if the previously held ideas about pre-solar grain formation environments match what the data say. So Asma has performed uh, cluster analysis, not only on the carbon and nitrogen ratios, but also the silicon isotopic ratios as well. In the figure on the right, you can see that the clustering results overlaid on the uh, nitrogen carbon diagram for ease of comparison. Um, and according to the uh, clustering results of these four ratios, there are actually nine distinct groupings, not six. Specifically, there are two types of AB stars, um, uh, which are generally thought to form in either J-type carbon stars, uh, born again AGB stars, or type two supernovas. There are two types of X grains. Um, and there are two kinds of MS grains. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there and invite you to check out our recently published paper for more details. But essentially we found things that confirmed previous ideas and things that are changing the way people think about the solar and pre-solar grain systems. So in, in summary, our planet and the other planets in our solar system and beyond have undergone a series of dramatic, sometimes catastrophic changes throughout their evolution. These changes and the stages that they demark have left their imprint on the minerals that formed or survived those events. It is my job as a mineralogist to extract the details of this history from their multivariate natures. And that is exactly what we're doing with the evolutionary system of mineralogy. And um, so I've gone over a number of projects here, so I'll just summarize uh, some of the key findings just to remind everyone if people had questions. Um, so first, we've been able to predict the number of missing mineral species on Earth. And with the same work, we've hypothesized that Earth's mineral diversity and distribution is a planetary scale biosignature. We observed higher dimensional multivariate trends embedded in network topologies, and we can use these to address various scientific questions, including putting protein evolution on an absolute timeline through Earth history. We've predicted the location of unknown minerals, analog environments, and mineral inventories of selected locations. And we're using cluster analysis to classify and uh, predict the formational conditions of mineral specimens based on geochemical data alone. And through this work, we are developing um, a we are developing an evolutionary system of mineralogy that places mineral classification in the context of planetary evolution. And I actually skipped the one before. Um, and with that, of course, we've estimated the complex major and minor element compositions of minerals and uh, other planets based on X-ray diffraction data alone. And we have thereby increased the value of sending already very valuable X-ray diffraction instrumentation uh, on planetary missions. So uh, with that, uh, I'll leave you with a broad statement that governs my thinking in the projects that I choose to pursue, and that is that answering questions in these complex evolving systems requires a multivariate, multidimensional, and interdisciplinary approach to integrating, visualizing, and analyzing our rich data resources in Earth and planetary materials. 
And um, so first of all, thank you all uh, for watching. Thank you for inviting me. I'm always glad to talk about and share my work. Uh, for those of you who are interested in playing around with some of our networks and exploring them, they are available at uh, dtdi.carnegiescience.edu. You can also learn more about um, our other projects uh, going on with the 4D initiative at 4d.carnegiescience.edu. And of course, there's my website, which has a link to all of these things and all of the papers and everything that I have just mentioned here. And um, of course, I would like to thank my many, many collaborators. I didn't put them on the title slide because all of their names would have filled the title slide. Um, so I have a lot of them. I'm very appreciative of all of the work uh, that they do with me. Um, they, they make my job really, really great and really exciting. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, the sponsors of this work, uh, who are many, and you can see right there uh, on the side of the slide. So I will just leave this up. And that way, if people want to take down uh, the, the websites. And with that, I guess we can go to any questions. And of course, if someone is watching this later on YouTube, please uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions. My email is available on my website. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the talk. Now it's time for questions from the audience. So, uh, Tiamo, please go ahead. Okay. So can you hear me clearly? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, Shauna. Uh, this is Montian from uh, University of Bern in Switzerland. And uh, I have two questions. One is about the evolution case. I mean, for all the other analysis that without a time as a variable, then that's okay. But if it involves time, then geological evolution might pose a problem of pres uh, preservational bias. So in terms of dealing with ev everything evolutionary, how do you roll out the possibility of bias? That's a great question. And I'm so glad you asked that. Um, I didn't get into it for the sake of time, um, but thank you for asking that. Uh, the answer is that, I mean, it's there. It's there, unquestionably, right. it is there. Um, there is a, yeah, there's an erosional bias. There's a preservational bias. Certain minerals are more likely to be preserved than others. Um, and it depends on also what they went through, right? So there's a huge, there's a huge preservational bias. Um, and it's a very hard, it's a very hard thing to get at. So what we've been doing is uh, going through and we've been collecting every possible parameter that we can that could not only inform us about preservation bias, so that would be things like um, hardness and I am blanking on the very basic chemical term, it's, it's likelihood to dissolve. I'm literally blanking on that term, but, um, but you know, all of the chemical parameters that determine um, whether or not it'd be preserved, but also in the case of minerals, there is another really big bias and that is sampling bias. And that is very much so biased by the color of a mineral, the size of the crystals that it forms, the shape of the crystals that it forms, its um, economic uses, uh, whether or not there's been a lab that has been particularly interested in that mineral. So the, the lab that I mentioned earlier, Peter Burns's lab at the University of Notre Dame, they study uranium minerals. So they have really been responsible for, for dramatically um, increasing the number of known and studied uranium minerals. Whereas, you know, is there someone out there studying the kind of white, sort of crummy, it just looks like kind of dust sodium minerals? Not really. So with mineral ecology, we can actually kind of start to predict, okay, we know there are a lot of missing sodium minerals that we don't know about. Um, whereas, okay, the copper minerals are a lot more well characterized because they're of economic significance, because they form kind of eye catching crystals, right? We're humans. And so when we're collecting things, these are the things that we see. So there are, there are lots of biases coming in from all sides. And what we're trying to do is to gather data that will allow us to characterize each one of these biases and to start developing some statistical models so that we can start backing these biases out. Um, we, right now, when we're looking at like our data through time and stuff, we, we often are trying to, you know, look at things like ratios and stuff like that versus absolute amounts and abundances and things because we know wholesale there's been a general loss of minerals as we go back through time right so mm -hmm. you know we have a lot of minerals that are very modern and not so many minerals that are very old and so we're really not basing anything on these kind of you know absolute amounts 
um, because you just can't, you can't. Um, but we are starting to, you know, look at ratios of, of you know, redox state and things like that, um, which again, it, it still has biases because some things are more likely to dissolve uh, and, and recrystallize and things like that. So, um, so the, the short answer to the question is, there are absolutely a lot of biases. Um, they're very complicated and we are actively working to, to try and figure out why that is. Um, a, a paper from, from our group, uh, that I wasn't directly involved in this one, but um, uh, Chow Liu and Simone Runyon published, um, well first Chow and then one with Simone, they published two papers on uh, the Rodinian supercontinent assembly because what we keep seeing in our data is that Rodinia looks different mineralogically and geochemically. And so to try and start to understand some of these biases, to try and start to understand what is a what is a real geologic signature and what is, you know, the product of erosion or the product of, you know, some other geologic process. I'm not saying that exactly right, but you know, it's interesting either way, right? It's, it's interesting no matter what. Um, but so trying to characterize some of these preservational biases, they went in and started examining why Rodinia looks different. And um, I don't know that they really and truly found the final answer. I don't know that there is one answer, right? There are often multiple things that are- I mean, in. this is a problem generally facing by any people studying evolutionary records in geological exactly. history. So exactly. I'm just posing this, but uh, yeah. please keep in this in mind. I have another more detailed question, which is about okay. mineral affinity analysis. Mm -hmm. You give an example of knowing some particular assemblage of minerals, and now you can predict the probability of an extra mineral's existence. Oh. So is that model a purely statistical model? I mean, given that you have data, you can do a statistical regression and propose your own statistical model to predict the mineral, the, the unknown mineral, or is it a machine learning model that is built on top of statistical model? You use a machine learning technique to do the regression and uh, to regress the parameters for the statistical model. So it's a, it's a question whether it is a purely statistical model or it's a machine learning model. It is a machine learning model. Um, so this is, it is basically the exact same model that is being used by Amazon. It's basically exactly what they're using. We're just modifying it um, for our purpose. So there are statistical relationships there um, to do with the association of these minerals. And then we're running a machine learning algorithm on I top see. of that. Um, yeah, so if you're if you're interested more in learning about the specifics of that algorithm, that it's it's up on GitHub. I can definitely send you the I can send you the okay. link if you're interested. I, I, it's useful I'm, for a lot of purposes. So I think yeah. that yeah, I'm just curious about this because it's fundamentally a, a statistical inference problem, yes. right? Whatever you use is a technique. So I just want to figure out that detail. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean that's kind of a good point about machine learning. Um, is that most of it is is statistics, right? And then there's, you know, some, it's, it's, it's all math, really. It's math and high performance computing. So yeah. yeah. And yeah, there are so many. I actually have a third uh, question, which is about okay. in machine learning, you have many so-called hyperparameters, right? In, in learning and fitting your, uh, your database, in your mm -hmm. testing database, and then do your, uh, your training set and test set. In doing your training set, you use many hyperparameters to derive the uh, parameters for a statistical model. But the thing is, how do we find a good hyperparameters? And is change of the hyperparameter will changing your result, your conclusion? That's, I mean, that's philosophically a problem of machine learning, not a problem of this research. Right, yeah, yeah, that is a problem that everyone is facing, trying to figure out what the best what the best combinations and things are to use. Yeah, and it's something that, you know, we try to perform a lot of statistical tests and, and you know, try to test kind of every sort of option. And, and that kind of brings back to the point of the importance of having the, the data scientists work with the domain scientists and understanding what, um, you know, what actually makes sense in a geologic in geologic terms you know if you just kind of run with the math you can perhaps get a little you know end up with things that aren't really telling you sure. anything that's new or anything that is you know very informative so i think it's really important that you know we're working together so that we can help 
inform this selection of parameters and, and what is most important. So, I yeah, see. but that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I've taken Thank too you. much time. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm going to re read uh, the two questions from the audience. And uh, uh, so two audience ask almost the same questions that are harder than NAS uh, in that network analysis generated. And uh, so, oh, so, so, so how are they are generated? Is mainly based on their structure similarity or based on their different chemical compositions? Could you repeat just the beginning of that, how the what is created? Us? Uh, the uh, yeah, in the network analysis, in the network analysis, how the links between the NAS are generated. How the links, oh, okay, yes. So, um, mm -hmm. so it depends on which network we're talking about. The one that we have pulled up here right now is the copper mineral network that I was showing you earlier. And um, that one is each of those nodes is a copper mineral species. Um, so something like chalcopyrite and malachite. And two nodes have a link if they co-occur at the same geologic locality, if they co-occur in the same deposit. Um, so in the case of the, the carbon network that I was showing, which I could go, let's see if I can just like quickly get back to that. Um, actually, let me exit and I can find it more quickly this way. So in the case of the carbon mineral locality network, so here we go, we've got it here. Um, these black nodes correspond to uh, mineral localities and the colored nodes correspond to carbon mineral species. And if they are linked together, that means that that carbon mineral occurs at that locality. So for instance, this locality, I hope you guys can see my cursor. Um, this locality in the upper left here is the Kola Peninsula in Russia, which is a very mineralogically diverse location. And it has a lot of mineral species that occur only there. So you can see, um, all of these these small nodes here they occur really only at uh only in the cola peninsula so that's what a, a link means in this case we also were looking at uh, some fossil networks and this is the same thing this is co-occurrence so this means that these two uh fossils occurred in the same deposit they occurred at the same uh geologic locality. Same thing um, for this trilobite network. So they occurred at the same deposit. Okay, uh, another question is uh, uh, asking that you missed the meaning of green circles in the slide on network and a mass extinction. So on that this slide, what are the green circles? This one. Yeah, so those are pinch points in the network. Uh, and what they symbolize is mass extinction events. So we didn't really know when we were creating these networks that this topology would, would pop out. Um, but it kind of makes sense when you start to think about why we're seeing this. So, you know, we had the Cambrian fauna and then things kind of died out, right? And then we have another, um, you know, explosion of the, the Paleozoic and, and there weren't a lot of during this in-between time, during this mass extinction event, there weren't a lot of things to co-occur together, right? We're looking at a co-occurrence network. So if there weren't a lot of things occurring in the same, in the same rock unit, then we're not going to have a lot of things co-occurring. And so what that means is you end up with these two kind of distinct lobes that are connected by just a few species that kind of bridged that gap through that mass extinction period. Um, and so the same thing as we're going from the Paleozoic into modern, um, and that's the same thing that we're seeing here uh, with the, sorry, with the, with the trilobite network. Most of the, most of the trilobites died off. Um, only a few species still were in existence. They're the ones that you can see are connected here, here, and here that were still um, alive and were able to be found in the same rock unit as these species right here, these taxa right here. Um, so that's why you're getting these pinch points. Mass extinction happens, everything kind of dies off, only a few species still exist. Uh, if no species still exist and co-occurred, then you would just have two entirely separate networks. There would be no links between them. But in this case, you know, there were still a few species um, that co-occurred um, in both of those, in both of those network examples. Okay, I think it's the last question. Uh, so, 
so the question is, so the mineral assemblages are different at different reaction stages. So how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with the minerals with the very complex chemical positions, for example, clay minerals? Yeah, clays are, are very complex. So I'm not exactly sure of the context of this question. Are we talking about when we're like predicting the location of mineral assemblages or do we mean for networks? Maybe you could read the networks. Again. Okay, in the case of networks, okay. Um, so in the case of networks, we each mineral node, so let me actually go back to a mineral network. Each mineral node corresponds to a mineral as defined by the International Mineralogical Association. So each clay mineral, however complex, has a name given to it by IMA. Now, if we start talking about the evolutionary system of mineralogy, where we're actually trying to classify minerals by their formational environment, um, it's going to be different. Our mineral classifications in that case are different from IMA classifications because IMA classifications are based on structure and composition, and that's how they get their name. Uh, in the evolutionary system of mineralogy, we're really trying to look at how these things formed. So for instance, you can have you know, a, a tourmaline that will be two different minerals according to the IMA, um, but it all formed in the same pegmatite from the same fluids. It just happened to be that the fluid composition changed a little bit over time. And so one end of the crystal, you have a certain composition and the other end, you have a slightly different composition. Um, you know, and it could be, it could be this is 48% whatever, and then this is 52% whatever. And that can be the difference between this is one mineral and this is another mineral. Um, so in the evolutionary system, we're calling that one thing. Um, so I don't wanna confuse too much about these two different um, ideas and, and projects. That aside from the evolutionary system, so if we just kind of put that away, which is very complicated, for these networks, for the sake of reproducibility, right now we are using the IMA definition, which depending upon your question, um, can be great or it can be problematic. But the one thing it is, is it's reproducible. There's a list, we know, okay, when you say natronite as a clay, we know exactly what that means and we're using the same vocabulary. So in this case, um, we don't really so much have to deal with those complications because we're just using what IMA says they are. However, in nature, and when we start getting into this evolutionary system of mineralogy project, we do start thinking about these things because they do matter. These, these chemical variations, these complexities, um, these uh, amorphous materials that are not really characterized by IMA are not considered minerals, but are geologic materials that are forming in the same way. They just don't have the long range order. All of these things matter. And so we are trying to start taking those into account and characterizing them by their formational environments and using their complex chemistries. Um, now, if it's something where it's incredibly hard to analyze, you know, clays can be very, they're notoriously hard to analyze. Um, you know, we can only deal with what we have um, data for, uh, but we're certainly, but we're certainly working on that. Um, so again, that was a long answer to a short question, but in the case of the mineral networks, it's if you go to rough.info forward slash IMA, there's a list of all the mineral species approved by IMA, and those represent the nodes here. And then if you go to our DTDI website and you hover over the nodes on those networks, you'll actually see those names as you would see on the IMA website. Okay, I think we ran a little bit over time. Um, thank you very much, Sharon, for, yeah, we're keeping you nine minutes more than what i've shared oh you're fine okay. thank you guys for having me okay. yeah thanks everybody for participating and uh have a good day thank you take care